Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology. This is the fourth unit, and we're going to talk about different types of agroecosystems that exist today. Um, this is a picture of a place in Montreal, Canada, and it is actually a greenhouse that they built on top of an old uh, office building or factory building, uh, and it's actually a functioning, um, if you look at it, you can see the green plants in there that are growing. But it's a functioning uh, greenhouse. And I just thought that was an interesting picture to show that and some of the stuff for agroecology can come in many forms, shapes, and sizes. Um, here's a picture of, and it's just a thing to kind of think back. This is back in the Dust Bowls um, earlier uh, in the last century. And basically, they found out that the Dust Bowl happened because they were plowing the land. And the wind was blowing the dirt all around and moving it from one place to the other. So they were creating their own problems because they had the dirt open and not covered too much of the year on the farms. And, of course, farmland takes up a good portion of the, and this uh, picture was out west um, in Kansas where they had the biggest problem with uh, the Dust Bowl. And what it is here, are we going to repeat the ways of our past? This is something that they went way too far and didn't worry about it. And then all of a sudden they had a huge, huge problem. Um, looking at agro systems, um, from that first one I said it comes in many sizes, shapes, and forms. Um, there's rooftop gardens, which are uh, some type of garden where you're growing something that is on top of uh, a building. There's community gardens, and that's more in the urban areas. You see it, although you can see it in small towns too. Um, but they're just an area where a bunch of neighbors will come together and mutually grow things and they'll all have their own little plot in a larger area. Could be a tear down that they have, it could be an old factory site, a lot of raised beds that they have in it. Um, there's also urban gardens and those are just gardens that are, are exclusively in, in areas that you wouldn't normally see uh, a smaller farm, but you could see areas of Detroit's a big example of that they have, but they had so many teardowns that they, instead of redeveloping the land and making the houses that used to be there, they'll have several blocks, and uh, as opposed to a community garden is a small area, um, you know, less than a block, maybe just a lot, a city lot. In an urban garden, it could be a whole city block that you'd have, and there's just that differentiation based on definition. Um, there's organic farms, and that's, um, you, everyone's probably heard about that. Um, a lot of the food you get at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, it's more healthy. So that's where the organic farms are. We'll talk a little bit about what they are. There's some that are very small farms, um, less than an acre. Some just have a greenhouse that they grow it in. And then there's some that have uh, many hundreds of acres that they use to uh, grow the crops. A lot of it is fruits and vegetables that you will get off that. You're not so much going to get the big, big processing that you have on a normal farm. Then there are fruit farmers out there. All they do is grow fruit. So it might be blueberries, it might be raspberries, it could be apples, all the different types of fruits you might have. And then there's vegetable farms. And um, we'll just talk a little bit about our area that um, vegetable farms around here, they could be stuff like potatoes, uh, carrots. Um, there's areas in Western Illinois that have, um, they grow pumpkins, they grow squash, um, they grow potatoes. Uh, and that's generally more in areas that will have sandy soil um, and that have a long enough season they can grow one or two crops of something if that's possible. And that's some of the ones that we're going to look at for the different types of agroecosystems. Um, just by way of definition, we'll certainly get into it in a lot more detail on, um, in other chapters of this course, other units of this course. Um, basically, what's the goal we have with agroecosystems? Um, reducing or eliminating external inputs. Uh, that's a fancy way of saying that we don't want to irrigate any more than we have to. We don't want to put any fertilizer on if we can do something to make the, the soil fertile. Um, we want to improve the soil health and biota. That kind of relates back to the first point, and the soil health is how well is something going to grow in it. And growing things that you are going to replenish what you're taking out and just not taking stuff out of the soil. 
and the biota is just the biology, the different uh, activities that are happening with the organisms for the soil to do what it needs to do. Um, attempting to mimic natural ecosystems, what that means, and it go, kind of goes back to getting rid of the uh, external import in, inputs, but basically what that means is you don't want to use synthetic methods to accomplish something. You want to let nature take its course, i.e., instead of irrigation, you grow things in an area, you're going to get enough rainfall that you don't have to worry about irrigating separately. Um, one of the things that's starting to happen in the field of agroecosystems is the belief that we need to try to improve the social standing of the residents. And by doing that, they believe that the people who are less fortunate than others that don't have um, a lot of things, that they start getting some of those things like most of us are used to getting and having. And, and it's the belief that people will start believing in themselves and it'll help them uh, in, in the areas that they live become uh, better citizens, I guess, would be the easy way to say it. Very controversial in what that really means. Um, and I suppose that's probably going to be one of the slower things that may be changes in this. Um, along that same line is sharing food equitably. In the last unit, we talked a little bit about how um, governments will buy food in other lands that we, when we had mentioned that 70% of our um, main crops are uh, exported to other nations, they don't necessarily get to the people that they supposedly were intended for, that the rich get it and the poor don't. Maybe that's another way of saying it. So there's the belief in agroecology that we need to learn how to, that we can share that food uh, more equally. Um, there's also a more global belief that um, the U.S. should share with less fortunate nations way more than they should, um, and that we're not doing enough of that. Uh, and then, um, big, big, big thing with agroecosystems, we touched a little bit about this in uh, the second unit also, that trying to sell food more locally. In other words, not growing it in California and shipping it to Illinois, or growing it in Florida and shipping it to Illinois or growing the corn in Illinois and shipping it to Florida, whatever the case may be, but try to grow it and sell it in the same area to reduce those transportation costs. Um, here's just a, a little bit of a picture, um, and, and basically what the, the, the picture is, is you have an area that's mountainous, it's uh, full of trees, and it's just showing that okay, we're going to start using the water that comes out of the mountains through the waterfalls down the streams um, that are going to come down to the bottom where in the greener areas where um, they talk about, they, in this instance here, it's in Costa Rica, but it's just an example. Um, they grow coffee, uh, corn, sugar cane, and then they have a few other products, but it's just they're using the water um, from the mountains to do it. They're not irrigating, so they're taking it out of there. Um, I'm sure there's a pond somewhere that we're not seeing if they do need to irrigate, um, but this looks like it's pretty uh, rainy, and I believe in Costa Rica it is a pretty rainy area. Um, they talk about some areas here where it shows you uh, wind breaks and what that would be for certain crops that they don't like to have um, as much wind, so it stops the wind from coming in. That's what a wind break is for. Um, it protects the land. It could also, uh, if you had erosion issues, it would, the wind is what makes erosion happen, so you wouldn't have as much of an erosion issue. Um, and then they're also talking about protecting from livestock. Um, in a Costa Rican area, when you have mountains or hills, you're going to have more winds that move around them, so that's what they're protecting it from, and that's why they grew it in this specific case. You don't necessarily in the Midwest need uh, that same type of protection. Okay, and then they have fences that they're showing here that we don't use, they don't use wood fences, they use real live trees or bushes to uh, separate one area from another. Um, so that would keep the animals from going. If it was dense enough, they wouldn't be able to go through it. Um, Agri-regrowth systems, um, they can be large or small, but in any event, each one can contribute to improving the ecosystem of the area. And that's one of the tenets by which we have to make sure we, um, we 
stay in line with because you can't assume because you have a small piece of property it doesn't matter every piece of property everything that you're growing something on or trying to grow something on is important to the ecosystem of that area so we have to be in tune with what things are we doing and how is it affecting that ecosystem um, we have to be concerned with reducing um, the runoff on our cover crops uh, and they do that by using grass um, plays and hedgerows and that's just basically things that are going to stop the water from moving as fast because if you get a big rain um, if you have a cover crop there it's not going to go as far through it because it's going to slow down because the cover crops there the grass ways if you look and that's just areas where it's very low and the reason there's grass there instead of crop is that um, that you never you can never control the water it's always going to run to the lowest spot so grass won't wash away it'll soak it in better than crops will and that's why we have that and then hedgerows are um, used basically what they're great for um, they got rid of them over the years from the 60s to the 70s to the 80s and now they're starting to come back as it attracts wildlife and it provides a protective area for wildlife so they can exist but it also keeps um, the wind from blowing land as uh, the dirt is much around so some dirt's always going to blow around so that helps uh, keep that from happening and we're starting to see hedgerows coming back um, bringing animals back into the ecosystem. Um, th they never realized that when they went to the large feedlots and they didn't have the animals on the individual farms, that how much they contributed to eating the grasses that were there, um, how much better the meat from that animal is because they're eating the grass. Um, they aren't needing as much corn. It's uh, the amount of corn that, it, say for instance, uh, uh, beef cow needs to eat during its lifetime is a tremendous amount which uses up a tremendous amount of crop and because we're using all the synthetic um, additive or nutrients as opposed to just letting the natural ones be there we're ending up um, making the environment worse instead of better so if you bring animals back it's actually helping because they can eat the grasses out in the pasture lands and then uh, after they eat of course they'll have their droppings and that is actually the fertilizer that can help make the grass grow again so, and they can actually take some of that in, uh, in dairy operations and swine operations and pig operations and actually get that uh, spread back out on the field if farms have that right now most farms don't have any livestock so that can help uh, improve the ecosystem um, and then if this works out they're finding out that insects will return and the beneficial organisms in the soil will come back into the area even if they're not there now and there are some areas where um, you know things went away and a good example just to kind of explain that on an ecosystem on uh, Love Canal or Lake Erie Lake Erie was considered a dead lake at one point uh, it's, it's the lake in Ohio um, and basically it was so polluted that no fish would even be in it they started cleaning up the pollution in the um, early 70s and it actually came back and it's a vibrant lake again so there's proof that stuff will come back if you clean the stuff up it's the same thing the soil in an area the trees in the area all everything in the ecology that you would normally think would be there will certainly come back if you uh, do it there's some doomsayers that were saying that you will never bring those things back but it's obvious that they can't be too far away because they all the areas uh, they have proven time and time again that things will come back if you improve uh, the ecosystem uh, here's an example of um, getting into the types of um, ecosystems um, this one is more how it's going to help is it's this one is in Millennium Park in Chicago <clears throat> and it might surprise you to learn that it's a green roof and you might say well wait a minute how can it be a green roof it's on the ground well it's because they have two levels of a garage below it they had the old railroad yards under it and at one time that was just all open space um, but L Millennium Park is in the um, northwest corner of Grant Park and uh, it's that real expensive one that they put in but they put in a lot of the new things a lot of native things uh, a lot of things attracting pollinators 
And this is a great example. We're not growing food in it, but it's still a, an, an agroecosystem because in this case, it, it, it looked like just all uh, the typical plants you'd want to go see in a garden, but it's attracting all the beneficial insects and they have great soil that's on top of there that they have it. Um, here's another view of Millennium Park. This is the southwest corner of it. Um, the buildings over here that you see, that's the Art Institute of Chicago to give you a reference point if you've ever been downtown. Um, and this is Columbus Drive over here. Um, but basically, um, there's an area in here where they have a lot of um, the detail that we saw in the last picture. And then this area here is just an area that um, it's in front of the band shells way down here in the picture. You don't see it in the picture, but it's just an area to go and relax and families can go out and have picnics and things like that. Um, what are the benefits of rooftop gardens? Well, in, in terms of for the building, it wouldn't be so much for um, the Grant Park parking garage, because that's what's underneath um, Millennium Park, um, but it will reduce an energy use in a building. Um, all new buildings in Chicago or substantial remodels have to put a green roof on um, their roof or they'll never get a building permit. But some of the things that it helps for the uh, people who own the building is in the wintertime it costs less to heat it because all the plants and materials that are up there are actually insulating um, and providing more of an ins insulation layer for um, the building, so it's not going to take as much energy to do it. And then, of course, in the summertime, um, less air conditioning is needed. Um, I don't have a picture of uh, the roof on the county building, City Hall, but they have a green roof on uh, the City Hall side, not the county side. And there's like a 35, 40 degree difference in temperature on a summer day. Um, from the side, if you're just standing over there on the roof because of the green roof as opposed to just the um, car and ship or gravel that's on the county side. So it does make a huge, huge, huge difference. Um, it also will take some of the rainwater um, and of course on every roof, the water hopefully doesn't stand up there, it runs off the roof. Um, they're all flat roofs in downtown Chicago, say, or pretty much most of them are. Um, and that water's got to go somewhere when it drains. Um, when it drains, it goes out into the storm sewers and then eventually into streams, uh, rivers, lakes, and down, you know, the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico and then into the ocean. So by having green roofs, the more they have, the less water that's going to leave your roof because it's going to take so much for uh, water in the plants that it has and it'll keep a certain amount uh, there and use it so it'll never get to the storm sewers. Um, it also, they're finding it's reducing the heat island effect and um, a little bit of that is when I talked about City Hall and the county building earlier, but the heat island is a reflection that you get off of blacktop onto the glass buildings downtown and it really, really heats the area. If you pay attention to the weather, downtown during the day will get hotter a lot of times than will out in the suburbs because of all the big buildings and the heat that's generated from uh, the sun heating up the buildings and reflecting off the blacktop. Um, and that's the heat island effect. Um, plus, they attract wildlife uh, to the vegetation and always having pollinators or birds, very, very good thing to have around. Um, some of it, it's it's food for other animals, so that might sound like something you don't even want to think about, but it's actually stuff that, that you know, that's very good. Um, but having wildlife around is very beneficial for everything in an ecosystem. Um, here's an example of a community garden, and um, basically all the sticks you see are the people, how they divide it up to different areas um, for what it is, but everybody in the neighborhood will just come and use a certain portion of it and grow vegetables. Generally in a community garden, they're uh, attempting some local community leader, it might be the alderman, it might be just a, a not-for-profit group, is trying to get um, people to understand many people have never grown their own food. They, have, they think that the food's in the supermarket. They have no idea where it came from. So for a lot of people, it's a novel thing to grow their own tomatoes or peppers or cucumbers or whatever it is they decide to grow. Um, some just come and grow flowers because they like to come and look at the flowers. Um, but they're learning, and especially younger people, if they can get their children involved, 
that they're learning how this stuff grows. And the hope is, is it'll start getting ingrained in people, this whole idea about growing stuff closer to you. And even not going to the supermarket to get stuff during the summer is certainly going to save energy and uh, go uh, a long way if a lot of people do it toward us becoming more sustainable. Um, here's a picture, uh, another picture of a community garden. It's just to show you the example. There's different things they're doing. This one might be one where, because there's a lot more crops, if you look, it looks like a whole row of what they're growing. Uh, this might be the community garden that they decide to, they're going to help a homeless shelter and they're growing food for it. So there might be part of the group that does that. So instead of just having each individual one, they might grow a whole large one. Uh, they might, uh, you know, give it to to different uh, groups that are out there. Um, they might give it and divvy it up amongst everyone that comes and helps do it too. There's all kinds of things. There's no real set rule for how community gardens work. Um, but <clears throat> some of the stuff it does, um, real quickly reviewing it, promotes the use of local food sources, i.e. you're not getting it from somewhere else, like from California, from uh, Florida, from Southern Illinois, wherever it's coming from. Um, so people can understand how you grow your own food, and certainly the food is um, better for you um, if you grow it properly. Uh, promoting social awareness, well, people are getting out, they're talking with each other, so they're getting to know their neighbors, they're getting to understand that there's an importance to worrying about, hey, someday we might not have enough food, we better start worrying about it now. Um, hopefully they're all friendships and uh, not feuds, but I'm sure there's some of both. Um, and when I talked earlier in the beginning of the thing, generally they're going to use vacant properties. You're probably not going to put a community garden on uh, a lot that has a house. You need something that we have some space. Um, organic farms, basically there's not a whole lot of difference in an organic farm, and an organic farmer is going to kill me for saying this, but basically there is no difference. The difference is, is that in organic they will not put any type of synthetic product on their crop, okay? Um, and that's an important thing because it's healthier and they're finding out just like the GMO type things that they don't believe, they believe those are starting to be passed, that those characteristics are starting to be passed on to humans through the animals from the plants. Um, so that, that can be certainly be an Okay, for organic farms, um, of course, it's just like um, the prior one for community gardens that creating a, so a local source for the food, uh, and it's a local s source that is actually very much higher because we don't have the um, types of uh, fertilizers and pesticides or herbicides that are synthetic, so that's better. Um, and then they don't use GMO seeds. so. GMO seeds are genetically modified organisms. Basically, it's all the hybrid seeds that are out there. Um, and most of the corn and soybeans that we talked about in the first unit that they needed to change, it's the same stuff we're talking about. Um, but they need to go back to something what technically is called open pollinated seeds. But basically what it means is that if you take the crop from the, the uh, yield that you get, and you can replant that the next year, it's going to come back and give you the same plant again. A lot of the hybrids or the GMOs that are out there, they will not do that. They would revert back to one of the crosses that they come from. That's what a hybrid is, a cross between two different uh, plants that what they try to do is get the best uh, qualities from each of them, um, which is what we're doing, trying to get that, remember, from the 40 uh, bushels an acre up to right around 300 bushels an acre and a 50, 60 year time spread, and that's doing the GMO seed. So organic farmers don't believe you should use that. Um, also, they believe that there is, should be a reduction in the external input, and that would be using the machinery and stuff like that. It's a lot easier for an organic farmer to say that because they're farming a smaller area. So when they go out and pick their tomatoes or their potatoes or whatever it is they're growing, they don't have as big of a plot, so they can hire a few people and go out and do it. They don't have hundreds or thousands of acres like the other farmers have. Um, so they aren't using those external inputs. Um, also, watering with um, irrigation is another one that would be an external input. Um, 
And of course, using the, you have less gas if you didn't use the mechanization, the tractors, and all, you know all the harvesting equipment, the combines, or whatever else you'd use. Um, also, on the um, organic farms, uh, it's a big thing. The definitions aren't quite there yet. We've been having organic food for a long time. To be truly organic, and there's organic and certified organic, and basically the difference is is how far away from a non-organic farm is the organic farm being grown. And truly certified organic means there's nothing, there's no some there's not someone using nitrogen or spraying some kind of weed killer within a uh, mile to a mile and a half of where this organic farm is. And that's very hard sometimes to get to that point. <coughs> um, here's an example of a farmer's market. This one happens to be in downtown Chicago at Daly Center that they have during the summer. Uh, and basically, uh, farmers come from all around um, and they sell whatever they have. So here they have some peppers. I see some potatoes in the background. It looks like some green beans are also in the background. But they just come and sell it and then all the people that work downtown or are visiting downtown can go and get their uh, all of their fruits and vegetables. Uh, and they're a lot fresher than what you get in a lot of stores or some stores. Um, here's an example of a guy who's just set up a farmer's market. It's not as large as something like the one in Daly Center, but you can see his pickups right behind him. He has his uh, price list in his truck, and he puts his, you see there's certainly not as much food as what's a Daily Center, but people come and get it. And these are more, they might set them up at a city hall or a park. Um, I know there's one that at Heinz VA Hospital. Um, that they have once a week during the summer. They have them uh, at city halls, at train stations, and um, basically you can get them in the, at that type of farmer's market also. <coughs> um, it's a locally grown food source. That's the, you start to see it's the general thing. All of them have to be, that's by definition. Um, but one of the things that's a little different from the organic, it's not necessarily organic. It may or may not be. Um, so, you know, you have to uh, ask questions when you're buying the stuff if organic is what you want. Um, certainly because you're going there, you're going to be, it's going to be more personalized. You're going to have, probably build a relationship. You'll like a certain farmer's uh, crop, and then you'll go there and you'll be there when he gets it because you like that. And then you'll develop relationships, even maybe some friendships. Um, you're certainly helping local farmers when you're doing that. Some of them might not necessarily be farmers. They might be urban farmers that just have a bigger area, like up in the Detroit area I was talking about. Um, and then also, because you're doing it, less external uh, inputs, you aren't going to use as much fuel to purchase that food because uh, it's going to be closer to home. So less of what was used to get it there from the farmer because he's going close to where he lives, hopefully, and you're not going to go as far to get it because it's going to be hopefully close to your house or where you work. Um, here's an example of a food co-op. A food co-op is a little bit different than the other things that we saw, the community gardens or the farmer's markets. And what it is, is it's a bunch of people will get together to form a group and they'll, many different ways you can do this, but you could um, buy into having one farmer and say, hey, we're going to buy your entire crop and then we're going to sell it to all our members. So you'd be you generally on a co-op, you pay to be a member or you pay in advance for the food you're going to get. And there, there's many, many, many different types of co-ops that are out there. Um, but it, those are becoming more popular. Um, there used to be farmer cooperatives way before. And the whole idea of it is you're buying more stuff. It's going to be readily available. Hopefully it's going to be cheaper. Um, you're, you know the source, so maybe it'll be fresher or better tasting. And um, you might have people that work in the cooperative that make sure that all that stuff's going to be there for you. <coughs> and here's just an example of, and this it's almost like a mini grocery store, um, and that you can go in and pick out the stuff you have. Generally, it's stuff you've already purchased. Um, some do operate, though, just like a grocery store. You come in and get what you want when you want it. Um, but you have to have a pretty good... Uh, combination of people coming at the right time because some of them vegetables as you know aren't going to last a long time. Um, to recap, food co-ops, a group of people get together, financially they put some money in, 
and they create a reliable food source. They say in the future that that's going to become very, very important because if you get that, that you're going to be able to make sure you get the food even if there isn't enough for everybody else. Time will tell on that one. Um, generally, it's not one farm that's involved. Generally, um, organic farmers, a lot of them specialize. They don't have a lot of variety. They'll do one or two or three different crops. Um, and you might have to go to more than one source to get it. You might not get, if you have a vegetable source, probably your fruit source isn't going to be the same one. <coughs> Although it could be. Um, another thing I talked earlier is the customers agree to buy a certain amount. In other words, you pay ahead of time. It's kind of like a country club type thing that you have to spend so much money. So, hey, I commit to spending $100 a month and I'm going to buy $100 worth of whatever you get. Um, and then, of course, again, it reduces the amount of fossil fuels that you're going to use. And then you get to traditional farms. Uh, generally, they're going to be the largest ones. Um, you could have organic farms that fit in this category. But generally, you don't see organic farms that are, you know, 200 acres, 400 acres, 1,000 acres that most common farmers, the, the old-fashioned, I guess I'll say, farmers were. Um, but what we're trying to get those farmers to do is understand that they have to transition from, when we talked in Unit 1, the monocropping, they have one, maybe two crops that they grow, um, to try to move away from that into um, possibly using non-GMO crops. The biggest problem, as you remember when we talked about in Unit 1, is that the non-GMO crops don't produce anywhere near the same amount of yield as do uh, GMO crops. And until you do that, money-wise, I don't think farmers are going to do that. We have to find a way to get better production using new methods. Um, there's some talk about trying to use perennial crops. An example would be you grow um, apples, and they're there every year for so year, and instead of replacing stuff every year like we're doing corn and that, so they might convert from being a corn farmer, soybean farmer, into being a fruit farmer. Um, other perennials, they're starting to come out with varieties of corn so that they could grow it every year, and they're trying to see, but of course there's many logistical issues with that because you have to harvest it. And, and, and will it work and will it produce? And so far they haven't had any luck on that. Um, trying to get them to integrate the animals into the agro e ecosystem, and we talked earlier in this unit, um, but basically it's so that you can um, provide the fertilizer you need, you can have the cows or whatever animal it is eat more natural things, and you don't have to have as much corn or soybeans to feed to the animals, so they're going to be better. Um, because they're fertilizing it with their droppings, that you're going to have a, a better land. It's going to be a better ecosystem. Um, trying to get farmers to use natural fertilizers, herbicides, and insecticides. Once again, that's the same as the non-GMO crops. Until they can get something that's as effective as what they're currently using that is synthetic, probably not going to change from what they're doing. Um, the only thing that might help on that, though, is that fertilizers are going up so high in cost because they're all based on oil products. They're derived from oil products, um, their original source, that that might help if the, the price of uh, oil keeps going up. That might keep affecting and might have them start to look at more natural um, solutions. And then... Um, on the traditional farms right now, crop rotation isn't something that happens a whole lot. Um, but we talked about the three or four year cycle in unit one, and that's where you put in corn one year, soybeans the next, then you let it lay fallow, you don't do anything, or you put in a cover crop like hay or wheat, and that will revitalize your uh, soil. Trying to get farmers to do that, put the hedgerows back, and if you recall, that will bring back wildlife. It cuts down on erosion and the wind moving the soil all around. And then um, the use of cover crops, which is keeping the land um, it not open. In other words, the dirt not exposed to wind. And that's going to help. If One thing, most cover crops will put a nutrient back into, uh, uh, into the soil, nitrogen, and that will certainly help uh, 
with the whole process of becoming more sustainable. Um, and continuing for the traditional farms, um, trying to get them to change what they're growing and what they do with their harvest. Right now, they bring it to a, an elevator and it gets generally shipped on a truck or a barge um, to the processing plants that are many, many hundreds, sometimes thousands of miles away. And they're trying to get them to try to sell stuff locally. Um, a farmer will tell you, I do sell locally. I sell it to the elevator and they give me the money for it. But what they're talking about is changing to a crop that you can sell locally and you don't have to do that with. Um, using animals to improve soil fertility and weed control. We talked about that on the last slide a little bit. And that all rolled in together is going to improve the soil biota. In other words, the biology of it is going to get better. And if that happens, the nutrients are going to get better. If the nutrients levels get better, then it's going to use those nutrients uh, and we're going to have much healthier crops. Um, once you start doing that, believe it or not, the wildlife understand that it's getting better and they start coming back and they provide a benefit um, to your farm, or to your ecosystem, excuse me. And then eventually what you're going to do, if you do all that stuff right or you do enough of it, it's going to change that local ecosystem and it's going to go back to what it used to be. Um, not all ecosystems are that much changed from what they are, but because we've done all this stuff and we've changed it so much, we have changed the ecosystems tremendously. Here's a list of the attributions, and I'll leave it up here for a couple minutes so you can see it. And then there is a, another page that you can see the attributions for that.